Well, here's three examples. They are not in your textbook. Let's just have a look at them. In the first one, I'm going to take the two legs, the three squared and the six squared, and solve for the hypotenuse. And when I do that, okay, you can you can all do arithmetic by now, but we can see we take the square root of, of um, well, t squared is t. The square root of 13, we're going to stick with the principal root, the positive root. And with your calculator, you could come up with a decimal approximation. So, of course, your teacher is going to want you to know some type of approximation, but also something called simplified radical form. This is your simplified radical form. Radical 13, it's as simple as it gets. Next one. This time, we're solving for a leg. Be careful. So, I've got the 3 and the 4 here. And watch what happens when I do my arithmetic. Aha. Uh -huh. See, I get radical 7, or square root of 7. My decimal approximation, about 2.6. And now you all get flustered when you see this. A radical 5. Well, radical 5, this is actually pretty easy. So, when I square this, I square the square root of 5. Of course, anything squared is itself. Square root of 5 squared is 5. The square root of 3 squared is 3. The square root of giraffe squared is giraffe, as we like to say. So, in this case, it looks like W, the hypotenuse, is radical 14, or about 3 and 7 tenths. Well, let's solve for the hypotenuse of this right triangle. And straightforward Pythagorean theorem application. We're going to square the legs, set that equal to the square of the hypotenuse. And we'll be mechanical on this one. We'll show the squaring. And we add the two squares. And then we're going to take the roots of both sides. Remember, you're taking only the positive or the principal root. And that's 65. So that tells us that this is a Pythagorean triple. Not one of the more common ones, but it is a triple. You know there's a time for simplified radical form. But this is a time for decimals. I'm giving measurements to the tenths here. Let's calculate, let's say, the missing side to the nearest tenth. So we set up the equation. Notice, again, we're solving for a leg in this case. So when I proceed here, I'm going to subtract that one square, the 79 and 21 hundredths, from the square of the hypotenuse. And there I go. And just to show what it would look like on our calculator. And we'll hit that old square root key. Let's carry all the digits, hit the square root there, and I can see about 14 and 1 tenth, like that. Well, let's see if we can find the area of this triangle. I know area of a triangle is 1 half base times height, and I already have the base. The base is right here. Remember, it's the whole triangle. Well, we know that the altitude of an isosceles triangle is also a median, so it bisects the base. Aha! Uh -huh. Once I've done that, well, I've got the 16 there. And right now you can see the obvious. We solve for the height using that green triangle, which is a right triangle. And I could do it the very straightforward way, factoring out the common 4. I can see that I have a 3, 4, 5 Pythagorean triple. The height is obviously 12. Now, if I didn't see that, I could have gone old school there again and done uh, solve for the height. Uh, square root of 144 is also 12. Now, just substitute, and I'm done. And again, an isosceles triangle, finding the area. I know area is 1 half base times height, and I already know the base. So, um, just like the last one, we're going to solve for the height here, the only thing we need, and that height is, of course, going to be, ready, it's going to be 4. This is, of course, a 3, 4, 5 triple, and if you're still not getting that, you can go old school here. Solve for it with the Pythagorean Theorem. h squared is 64, h is 8. So the height is 8, and we'll substitute it, and there you go. Well, if I was solving for this leg, already gotten over here. That would be the tedious method using the Pythagorean theorem on this one. 
because it's so easy when it's such a simple Pythagorean triple. Three, four, five, triple, 10 times four, 40. Okay, we're given two sides of a Pythagorean triple, meaning the third side's also a whole number. Let's see what we can find. Start here. Factor out a common four on these two numbers. That jumps right out at you. And I can see that what remains is the seven and 24. Now that's helpful. See, seven and 24, those two numbers are relatively prime, but that helps me recognize this. This is one of the four Pythagorean triples that are so, well, they just show up so much in this book and plus I've asked you to memorize them. So you recognize a 7, 24, 25, and then you say, aha, let's assign the values. Let's just multiply all those sides by four again. And of course, four times 25 is 100. That is the missing side. It is the hypotenuse. Well, just like the last one, let's start by factoring out that common factor of four. Well, that's going to give me five and 12. After all, five and 12 are relatively prime, just like the last example. So now let's see what we've got here. Well, that's going to give me the ubiquitous 5, 12, 13 Pythagorean triple. And let's see, uh, that's simple enough. I guess what we're missing is the 13. And four times 13 is 52. So the missing side is actually 52, and it is a hypotenuse. Okay, one more of these, 75 and 85. Well, right away, I can see a common factor of five there. And there you go, eight, 15, 17 triangle. One that you're expected to know. And of course, restoring that factor of five, the missing side is the 40, or is eight times five. Well, we have a figure here, which later we'll learn is a trapezoid. And um, I've shaded part of it for you because we're obviously going to use the Pythagorean theorem and we're going to use this triangle to solve for the missing side, x. Pretty straightforward. Um, remember, we're going to use simplified radical form. So let's learn a little trick here. First, we'll do it old school. We'll do the substitution. Okay, the side's three. These little Tommy tick marks tell me this side's six because that one is. Substitution, that's easy. I can evaluate, then add those two terms together. Now, of course, I have to take the square root of both sides of the equation. And this is the part. Now, you all can do that. And you all can get there with a calculator, get a decimal approximation. But make sure you know how to do this. Factor. I'm going to take this, 45 and I'm going to factor it into the product of 9 and 5. Now, why 9 and 5? Simply because 9 is a perfect square. So, square root of 9 is 3, so that means it is 3 radical 5, which means 3 times radical 5, or if you want to say it this way, 3 radical 5s. I suppose we're done, but let's learn something else. There's another way we can do this using similar triangles. Sometimes this is referred to as the simplified triangle method. Whatever you call it, it goes like this. I'm going to take this try I'm going to take this figure over here. And really what I'm doing, imagine I'm going to shrink it up here where each of the measurements is a third. So instead of threes and sixes, I've got one and two. Well, you probably see where this is going. We just employ the Pythagorean theorem the way we did before, and pretty straightforward, easy as 1, 4, 5. Square root of 5 would be the hypotenuse of this figure. And since each measurement of this figure, which is color-coded in green, is a factor of 3 smaller than this original blue figure, I'm just going to take that radical 5 and multiply it back by 3, and that would give me the value of this x. Same answer, different method. Well, let's solve another, in this case, hypotenuse in simplified radical form, and I'm giving this 11 here.
these tick marks tell me I've got 11 and 11 there. Already set up for you right there. Let's just go into simplifying. 11 squared is 121. So there you go. I could add those together. 242. And then, of course, I could say, taking the square root of both sides, and then I could factor this out. Well, factor out that radical 121, because, after all, I know that it's 11. And there you go. This side would be 11 radical 2. Now, you probably notice that looks, looks like kind of it's unnecessary work there, and it is. Um, let's get used to doing it the smarter way. And it's going to be, imagine this, just like we did before. I'm going to shrink this down. Imagine a figure. Instead of 11 and 11, it's going, these sides, our legs are going to be 1 and 1. So, I do the same thing this way. And then, I know that, well, I've got 1 and 1. 1 squared plus 1 squared. So, c squared is 2. C, the hypotenuse of this figure, is the square root of 2, or radical 2. And I must multiply it by 11 to move back to this scale. So, of course, that means the side 11 radical 2. So, we have two right triangles, the blue one and the magenta. We're solving for this side, but we're going to have to first find this one. So, let's go from blue to magenta. Straightforward. I'm going to set up solving again here. 3 squared plus the unknown side squared equals 5 squared. And I just go through the arithmetic. Oh, you're getting good at this by now. If B squared is 16. B is 4. You know, to be honest, you in the future, you'll just say, well, that's a 3, 4, 5 Pythagorean triple. You would have recognized that and not done these steps at all. So either way, you got the 4. Now, it's straight ahead. We just, again, use the Pythagorean theorem. And let's see, we've got our squares. We combine our squares, and therefore, the missing side is radical 65. Simplest radical form. Can I simplify that? Well, let me see, 65 can only be factored as 5 and 13. Neither of those are perfect squares, so this is your solution. You're done. Well, this looks like a, quite an algebra exercise. A little silly, but let's set it up. I've color-coded the sides there, the two legs equal to the hypotenuse squared, and then we do the expansion. Remember, these are binomials, the purple and the green, so you're going to get a pair of perfect square trinomials. All right, back to algebra if you don't know what that's all about. But let's just take it from here. Got 4x squareds here, and I've got 8x squared, and I'll let's say take it away from the 16x squared. I'm going to have 8x squared left over here. And if I take this 16x here, and I'll take it away from the negative 32x, watch those signs, negative 48x. And of course, I've got 16 subtracting from both sides. Well, that works out nicely. In the end, all I've got is I've got zero. Well, just solve this right away. I've got 8x squared minus 48x equals 0. I can factor out the 8x easy enough, and my two roots are 0 and 6. But I'll tell you what, I am going to reject the 0. I mean, after all, if, um, if x is 0, I have a triangle with a length, a leg length of 2x or 0. And that's, uh, that's bogus, so I guess 6 is your answer. Well, interesting question. Which of these three is the hypotenuse? Well, silly, obviously the longest side. But let's see if it even is a right triangle. Well, this checks out okay. That's just arithmetic. But you could have done this. Take these three numbers and factor out a common five. Now, five, 12, and 13 are what we call relatively prime. 12, obviously, is not prime. But five, 12, and 13 are relatively prime. And that's, go further, that's a Pythagorean triple you're going to have to know because we see it a lot.